This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. 67. Risk Management. Good corporate governance involves effective risk management, and the effective, that effective risk management in turn involves a sound system of internal control. How many times did I say sound system of internal control yesterday? Many. Countless. Just sound system of internal control. And good corporate governance will eliminate, or at least decrease, many of the risks which companies face. The fair treatment of shareholders is part of it, and the rights of shareholders, and the role of stakeholders. Disclosure and transparency. And board responsibility. So good corporate governance will address these five areas, and on the next page, 68, we've got three of the first three of them are specifically talked about. The fair treatment of shells. Preferential treatment should not be given to any one group of shareholders in preference to any others. Although, I was saying yesterday that if Sonia Tan from Sentosa House is not given better treatment than me with my 14 shares, then she's going to get upset. Why should she be treated uh, the same as just an ordinary small shareholder? And the answer is because all shareholders should be treated equally, should be treated fairly. If they're not, if, if Thomas Hu, from that question seven yesterday, if Thomas Hu were to give preferential treatment to any individual shareholder or combination of shareholders, then those who are not being the beneficiaries of that preferential treatment could object. Why, sh why are you treating them differently? They hold shares, I hold shares. Why are you treating us differently? But I can understand, in practice, I could understand that a company would pay greater attention to the interests and well-being and the information given to the bigger shareholders because they have to keep the big shareholders happy. They don't have to keep me happy with my 14 shares. So the shareholders could resent it. And it could result in bad publicity for the company. If we don't treat the shareholders equally, if we give an undue preference to any one or any group of shareholders, then the rest of us could get upset. Does it matter if I get upset? Does it matter to a company if with my small shareholding I get upset? 14 shares is a small shareholding. It depends, obviously, if there are only 16 shares in issue, then 14 is a substantial shareholding. Well, 14 shares in a big company is nothing. But what about 140? What about 1,400? At what, at what stage does my sure how small shareholding become important in the eyes of the company? 20%? Significant influence? What about 19%? It depends. If, 20, if 20 is significant, why is 19.9 not significant? Well, it depends on the yeah the disposition of the other shareholdings. Yes, it certainly does that. Um, but then you then you have to make it a variable thing, don't you? If there's there's only tiny other shareholders holding point zero 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 two percent, if that's the next biggest shareholding, then clearly my fourteen shares, my fourteen percent, is substantial. But even then, the the problem still arises. Consider the disposition of the other shareholders. Their next highest is 0 0.002, and I've got 1%. Is mine significant? I've got, I've got 50 times more, 500 times more, than the next biggest shareholder. Is mine significant? 50 times. And, and if it is, or if it's not, if it's not, then when does it become significant? Is it 1.1% or 1.2% or 10%? It, it's such a variable thing. I don't see how anyone can talk in terms of big shareholders should be looked after well and small shareholders we can ignore because they change their shareholdings. And they don't lo they're not loyal. We, we mentioned that yesterday. There's no loyalty from shareholders to their company. There's no need for them to be loyal. The rights of shareholders. The entity may not allow shareholders' rights. That's against the Constitution, and there is case law in F4, where companies have ignored their own Constitution, 
and their shareholders have sued and said you can't break your constitution like that. You have to obey the rules of the company. So if the company fails to allow a shareholder to join in discussions at the annual general meeting, or if the company fails to communicate details of the annual general meeting, they're not allowed to. The constitution says all shareholders must be notified of the annual general meeting. There is a case called West Canadian Collieries where, Collieries, where um, there was an accidental omission to notify a particular shareholder. Um, and it was determined that the accidental omission was not a breach of the law. You have to accept that mistakes will be made and the accidental omission did not destroy the validity of the annual general meeting. The role of stakeholders. Entities may ignore their stakeholders. A stakeholder group could be treated inappropriately. Uh, for example, if an entity tries to make an employee redundant without following established legal procedures, so we're no longer in compliance with the law, uh, and if we're affecting, badly affecting any individual stakeholder or a stakeholder group, uh, then the company is no longer complying with good corporate governance. Page 69, the final two principles, disclosure requirements and transparency arrangements. They just possibly fail to provide appropriate reports. They fail to report the true financial position. It's necessarily the case that for proper disclosure and transparency, we have this sound system of internal control. again. And then finally from Turnbull, the board responsibilities. The board possibly doesn't control the entity properly or adequately. The board attempts to run it for its own benefit rather than for the benefit of shareholders and other stakeholders. So these are the matters, the principles of corporate governance that Turnbull identified. Uh, and these were the examples, these were the uh, illustrative situations where they couldn't, they could be in breach of the principles of good corporate governance. Page 70, management's responsibility for risk management. Just before we get into page 70 though, it's a, a strange thing that as you get older you, you tend to forget things which are just a short time earlier. And I've already forgotten the characteristics of good information. I've already forgotten what they were. Can you help me, please? I know there were two A's. I remember there were two A's. Accurate, accurate and what was the other one? Yeah. Adequate. Accurate and adequate. That's right. And then there were three C's. I think there were three C's, weren't there? Concise. And a word which is pretty similar to concise, but a little bit longer. Consistent. And then... Compl compl complete, wasn't it? Complete. I just to check. It doesn't matter. We, we can go back and check later. There's no need to check immediately. Uh, but I think the next one was an I. Integrated. Integrated, yeah. I think that was the, the next one. I. Uh, J, K, L, M, N, O. O? O. Who? Objective, Objective P. Provable. There were no Qs, were there? There's no, there's not a Q. Then we had R and R. Reliable. And reliable, uh, reliable and relevant. Um, S T. Timely. timely. U. Unbiased. 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 And 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 you. Understandable. Understandable. Yeah. I don't think we've missed any, have we? Yeah, just check. <laughs> just check, see whether we missed any. There we are, we've got, we've got AA. What was the AA? Accurate and, and adequate. Yeah, and then we had three C's. Complete. Concise. Yeah. And the longer word from concise? Consequent. Consistent. Consistent. Consist and then we had the I. Uh, which is always either independent or integrity, but it's not either of these. Integrated, yeah. And then we had the O. Objective. And P. Provable. And then we had two R's. Reliable. 
Yes, reliable and they're like twins. These it's like Castor and Pollux or Romulus and Remus. That two hours are not Romulus and Remus. They're reliable and relevant, relevant and reliable. And then we had a T. What was the T? And then you, and you, and understandable. Yeah. Good. Page seventy. Yeah, page seventy. Risk is defined as. Page 70. Risk is defined as the chance, the chance of ex exposure to the adverse consequences of uncertain future events. That's not really, I don't know that's a, a good enough definition, but who am I? Because there is a, a thing called upside risk as well. Risk surely then is, is the consequences um, of whether they're adverse or favourable consequences. So it's the chance of exposure to mm, changes in the environment. The chance of exposure uh, resulting... F chance of exposure... Uh, chance of exposure to the consequences of future events, uncertain future events. It doesn't have to be adverse consequences, although if someone says it's risky, it tends to imply automatically that it's a potential adverse position. But actually risk can apply both ways. It can be seen then that risk can adversely affect the achievement of the entity's objectives. It can. If we've got these uncertain future events and they adversely affect us, then that's going to prevent us from, possibly, prevent us from achieving our objectives. And by reducing the likelihood of the event, we're then beginning to manage the risk. If we can either reduce the likelihood or reduce its impact, then we manage the risk. And responsibility for risk management is management's responsibility, and they will do so by establishing a risk management system. <coughs> the process of risk management, identification analysis. Report, design, recommend, implement, evaluate. There is a, a football team in Scotland, and I'm sure you, all of you will have heard of this team because it's a very famous football team and I know you're all keen on football. Uh, and it's the, the local town team and it's called Airdrie. It's called Airdrie. And if you think about Airdrie, it's almost a mnemonic for... I've just changed those first two around. Analysis, identification, and then we've got report, design, recommend, implement, evaluate. So Airdrie is your Scottish football team mnemonic. Identify analyze, report, design, recommend, implement, evaluate. This is the process of internal controls as well as risk management. It's the identification of the list of the potential risks and then the prioritization of that list. So identification and prioritization. So it's almost Adri, it's not quite. Now, it's possibly the case that some of you female students are not aware of Scottish football teams and therefore probably a little bit closer to home and closer to your own hearts uh, would be hair dryer without the human resource. The process of analysing and managing risk, or the process of identification of internal controls, and it's what you auditors, you external auditors do. You identify and analyse, and then report, design, recommend, implement, and evaluate. So design the risk management system prepare avoidance and contingency plans and then recommend the, the designed system for implementation. 
I would imagine that you'd consider a number of alternative ways of achieving the same objective and then make a recommendation that, that of the alternatives you've, you feel that this one is the best one or the better one. So recommend the design system for implementation and then implement. It's management's responsibilities, but management are too busy managing. It's the executive board responsibilities. But they're busy managing the company and running the company and keeping it focused and creating a culture or an environment of discipline and control. So it will actually be the, the people lower down in the structure. It will be the departmental managers who implement and put in place this system. And it will be the workers who actually operate the system which has been implemented by the middle level management as a result of an instruction from the top level management who have received these recommendations and this report from either their internal auditors or from the risk manager. But that's how we will process risk management system and how it's established. Page 71, risk management, it's necessary to manage the risk. Identify those new risks which may affect the entity so an appropriate management strategy can be decided. In this identification, how many people, how many American auditors or risk managers could possibly have thought that an aeroplane would try and land within the World Trade Center? But that's the sort of risk that maybe should have been identified. And I know certainly John has already taken steps to mitigate and reduce the risk that an aeroplane will land in this building. Um, but I've, I've, I've got an apartment down the road. Uh, it's on the fourth floor. And I went to see my insurance people. And I said, what's this? Because I obviously I can't read the language. I said, what's this? And he said, it's insurance damaged by fire. What's this one? And he said, it's damaged from motor vehicles. And I'm on the fourth floor. And what damage? I've got visions of Harry Potter coming <laughs> in, his, in his Ford Anglia and hitting my fourth floor apartment. But it's risk management. Just in case a flying car should happen to come by, I've actually transferred the risk by insuring it against car damage. But it's, it's very strange. Maybe, maybe I want to what? Park my car in the apartment? No, your motorcycle, you know. I, I don't honestly think I'm going to suffer car damage, although he did justify it, the insurance guy did justify it. If you think in terms of um, the apartments quite close to the road, if you think of the car coming along the road and, and skids and smacks into there, and if he, the car damages the apartment block by, by breaking one of the corner structures, then um, you can understand that I would have to be insured because it may be that everything else then tumbles down. So it is justifiable. It's just very strange. It just struck me as very peculiar that I should be covered for car damage. But ident now, risk identification. Do you? Does your company identify it? unusual risks du jour do any of you do any of you Edgar's does your company identify unusual risks no yours they essentially insure against everything almost they insure against everything including cars that fly <laughs> all right I don't know that I don't know how people are clever enough to identify all risks. I don't know I, how can you do that? Flooding. I suppose you flooding here would be appropriate, wouldn't it? Because you're you're by the sea. But when I lived in the UK, it was on the side of a hill. It was about 800 meters above sea level. And why would I want to insure against flooding there? I'm 800 meters above and I know the river is not that sea level because otherwise I will be by the sea but I'm I'm on the side of a steep hill 
There's just not a chance that I'm going to suffer. Although actually there is, I suppose, because down at the bottom of the hill there's a river, obviously, because that's where rivers live. Um, and if the river does flood and it does wash away the banks, then the whole, the whole side of the hill could slide down, taking my house with it. So is that, is that damage from flooding? I don't know. Okay, let's move on. 71. Identify changes to existing unknown risks. Where am I? Necessary to manage risk. Identify new risks that may affect the entity, so an appropriate management strategy can be designed. Identify changes to existing unknown risks, so that we can be flexible and amend our existing strategy. And ensure that best use is made of changing opportunities. And just looking at this poster, and this guy here is talking about the company Mildus Tietens, Tietens is good? Tietens? Hmm? All right, okay. Um, and here, in this grey poster, it says threats turned into opportunities. So, supermarkets provide mainly standardised products, uh, big pressures from supermarkets, existing plot with good visibility and high traffic of potential customers, and they've changed these threats space for promoting local producers, local producers willing to open their own stores, and they've changed those into opportunities and risk management. What's the risk that local producers are going to start selling themselves, or selling their own goods direct to the public? Why not offer them some sort of deal where they sell it to us and then we will supply the supermarkets? And that's what this company's done. Okay, managing the upside, risk applies equally to good news, and the upside risk needs to be managed just as much as downside. The upside, if you identify a, a potential, uh, then we need to manage it to make greatest use of that potential, to take greatest advantage of it. And that's what managing upside risk is. Down at the bottom there of page 71, management is viewed in a different way than the downside risk, because risks are seen as opportunities. The threats converted into opportunities. Organizations prepared to accept some uncertainty in order to obtain greater benefits and higher rewards associated with higher risks. <clears throat> if it's an upside potential, then why not take the bigger risk? Why not take the greatest advantage of the possible or possible advantage of the upside risk? Because the more extreme you go, the greater the rewards. This is the nature of risk. The more extreme you go, the greater the rewards. Developing new products for small companies. The more extreme you go, the greater the possibility that you'll make a lot of money. But if you don't go extreme, if you just stay the, the cautious central path, then you just stay the cautious central path and you never actually achieve a great deal. Risk management is used to identify risks associated with new opportunities leading to an increase in probability of profitability and therefore maximize returns. If risk management is operating effectively, then we can identify the risks which are associated with the... Op what about open tuition? A good question. What about open tuition? Is that not a risk? Taken by the people who run open tuition? That's a risk, surely. That, that investing huge resources into the concept of open tuition, uh, but it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. There's almost 100,000 worldwide membership of it. Um, do you see any upside potential? Or is it just an investment by those people who are involved? Hello? Do you ever look at the site? Yeah? But, well, I didn't have to pay anything yet. You, you've never had to pay anything yet. You've never had to pay anything, and nor will you be. I mean, one, one, of, the, one of the fundamental missions of the Open Tuition Site is that it shall be free resources for accountancy students. That's, that's the mission, free resources for accountancy students. So you, you won't be asked ever to pay anything. So what's the risk then if it's 
So what's the risk? It's the investment of the people who are involved, their, their time, and there's a lot of money gone into it. Just don't get anything back. But absolutely nothing comes back. Mm. Nothing. Because you've never paid anything, and therefore the people who are on the site have got nothing out of it. Mm. It's just out of the kindness of their hearts. It gives them a, a warm feeling. The risk is that uh, hackers might attack and... Tell me again. Uh, hackers. Hackers? I don't think we've ever had any hackers on the site. I don't think so. I don't know. You could always, always type a question, ask admin if they've ever suffered any hacking activities. Do you ever go on the site? No, but I, I, I know that it's not absolute that there, will be, there wouldn't be any money involved. Because I know, uh, as John told me, that uh, if you go on the site, we should click on commercials because this uh, site is operated. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> it's um, it's growing. The, the projection is that by the middle of next month, so in about two more weeks, we'll get to the uh, hundred thousand people. It, it's growing about a thousand a week at the moment. Unbelievable. Okay, imagine the upside. Is there any any risk? Yes, you keep clicking. You keep clicking. <laughs> Risk management is used to identify risks associated with new opportunities leading to an increase in probability of profit. We've said that. Effective risk management is seen as a way of improving shareholder value by improving performance. And surely, is that not what companies are created for? What, what is the objective of a company being created? What's it for? What's its fundamental reason? Yes, to provide... TSR. Now these, all the rest of these people know what TSR were, but because you were unfortunately absent yesterday, <laughs> you possibly don't. Do you want to guess what TSR is, or shall we ask? Let's ask. We'll ask. Okay, what's TSR? The total shareholder return. Total shareholder return, that's what TSR is. Uh, so that's why companies are created. Well, it is and it's not. There are some companies which are created just to provide a service and not necessarily provide a service at a profit. Um, the charities, for instance, they're not, they're not there to make a profit. They're still companies. They're not there to make a profit. They're there to, to provide help and assistance and, and uh, relief to those people who need it. And open tuition has not been created to make a profit. It's been there to, to assist students worldwide, to use the expertise to benefit students worldwide. Okay, I'm on page 72, I think. Strategic risks, operational risks. Strategic are those which arise from the possible consequences of strategic decisions being taken badly. An example would be where one entity does pursue a strategy of growth by acquisition, where another one aims to grow organically. The acquisition one will be the greater risk, but on the other hand the returns are probably greater and certainly quicker, or potentially certainly quicker. So that would be a strategic risk that you face, and it depends on how cautious you are. Are you happy to just let it grow and grow and grow, or do you want to be aggressive in your expansion um, attitude? Operational risk, the risk of losses resulting from inadequate or failed internal processes, people, systems, or even from external events, uh, things like running out of inventory and not being able to um, satisfy customer demand, risk of fraud or theft by employees. We should be able to manage these by internal control systems and by proper control being established. We shouldn't suffer stockouts. If we have stockouts, we lose business, we lose reputation, we lose market share, we lose confidence in our customers, or the customers will lose confidence in us, and, and we could be facing a disaster situation. So we shouldn't have stockouts. We should always be able to meet the customer demand. So that would be an operational risk. Inability to produce because of machine breakdown. An internal control would make sure that your machines didn't break down. Or if they did, you've got an alternative, a resource available to continue to produce in order to still meet customer demand. 
So these risks are identifiable. Strategic ones are the sort of bigger decision ones taken by strategic executive management. But the operational ones are just as important.